Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. Two weeks before the extraordinary Synod of Bishops on the Family is to convene in Rome, the Vatican announced, as you heard, the formation of a special commission to study the marriage annulment process in the Catholic Church. Now, this has raised the stakes at the Synod, and even bolder proposals are now being floated. Also this week, the U.S. appears to be heading back to war in Iraq against the terrorist group ISIS. Does this pass the just war test? To sift through it all, we're joined by papal biographer and senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, our pal George Weigel. Hello, Thanks Ray. for being here. Nice to uh, be I want to play a bite for you. This is the president at the UN this week laying out the threat that faces the United States and trying to put ISIS in some context. Listen to this. I want your reaction. We have reaffirmed again and again that the United States is not and never will be at war with Islam. Islam teaches peace. Muslims the world over aspire to live with dignity and a sense of justice. And when it comes to America and Islam, there is no us and them. There is only us because millions of Muslim Americans are part of the fabric of our country. Is what we are seeing in Iraq and Syria not part of the tradition of Islam? What we're seeing in Iraq and Syria and indeed all over the world, Raymond, is the playing out on a global stage of a civil war within Islam mm. that has now burst out of that world to involve just about everybody else. Uh, the war is between those Muslims who want to find an Islamic path towards religious tolerance, political pluralism, and those represented who essentially by whom, uh, represented who, who by there are moderate Islamic scholars here in the United States. There are some yeah. states, Indonesia, Malaysia, some places that are slowly and with some difficulty moving in this mm -hmm. direction. Senegal might be another yeah. example. And those who wish to recreate the eighth century Arabic world. And that's mm -hmm. that's really what you've got in ISIS or ISIL or as I call it, the caliphate, the cal since that's what they claim they wish they to, are. to recreate. You've mm -hmm. got some of the you've got eighth century, seventh century minds mm -hmm. with twenty first century weapons. Yeah. Uh, which unfortunately they got from us mm. because of the extraordinary uh, default in responsibility of the present administration mm. in abandoning an effort that was on the verge of success in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that abandonment has now created an even more dangerous. And that abandonment was what? Pulling the troops sure, out, not sure. training failing, them completely? Failing to understand, failing to explain to the American people that this was something like Korea. Mm. This was something where we were going to have to be there, not perhaps in large numbers, but in sufficient numbers, to create the security environment in which something resembling civil society could, could take hold mm. and out of that civil society could come a more decent politics. Now why we can't name these things for what they are has been a mystery ever since 9-11 and indeed before 9-11. But until we begin to name them for what they are, we are not going to find a path to intelligent policy, I'm afraid. You wrote a fascinating piece not long ago about the vindication of Benedict XVI's Regensburg lecture. Right. I want to put a little piece of that on screen, and I'd like you to comment. At one point, referencing a Byzantine emperor, he said, without descending to details such as the indifference in treatment accorded to those who have the book and the infidels, he, the emperor, addresses his interlocutor with a startling brusqueness, a brusqueness that we find unacceptable on the central question about the relationship between religion and violence in general, saying, show me just what Muhammad brought that was new and there, will, there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. The emperor, after having expressed himself so forcefully, goes on to explain in detail the reasons why spreading the faith through violence is something unreasonable. What was the point of Benedict's lecture? What were the issues he was trying to engage the world on, and Islam particularly? I suspect if 
Benedict the Sixteenth had to do it all over again. He would have gotten right to his argument without illustrating it with a you know an interesting sideline from early medieval history, which then began to be obsessed upon by mm -hmm. the world press, right. who then missed the argument. He was trying to raise two points and then make a proposal. The two points were, two questions were, can Islam find within its own religious resources warrants, arguments in favor of religious tolerance, including tolerance of those who change their religious location, and can Islam find within itself Islamic buttressing hmm. for the distinction between spiritual and political authority in a 21st century state? Then the Pope said, you know, maybe this is something we could be of some modest assistance on, because it took the Catholic Church about 200 years to figure out from within its own resources, mm -hmm. not by surrendering to political modernity, right but from within Catholic resources, how to affirm religious freedom and how to affirm constitutional democracy. All of that has been comprehensively lost, but that's what the issues are. Hmm. He exactly identified the two crucial questions both within Islam and, and between outside. Islam and the rest. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to move forward a little bit. Please. Pope Francis said, during his flight home from Korea recently, you can stop an aggressor, an unjust aggressor, but I didn't say you could do it with bombs. He also said one country shouldn't be making these decisions. It should be made by the community of countries. Your thoughts? Uh, there is no community of countries, uh, and I think it would be clarifying for all of us, including the senior officials of the Holy See, to stop using the phrase, the world community. That doesn't exist. Uh, to wait for the United Nations to do anything is, at least since the Korean War, to wait endlessly. Mm. The fact of the matter is, when there are outlaws loose in the world, as is clearly the case with ISIS, ISIL, the caliphate, mm. somebody's got to organize the posse. Mm. That somebody is almost certainly, in these kinds of instances, going to be the United States. Now, it doesn't mean we should do it alone. I think the principal threat that ISIS poses is to fellow Arabs throughout the Middle East. They should be doing the heavy lifting on this, but we've got to organize things. Hmm. And that seems to me to stop murderous people from the mass slaughter of innocents, if that is not a justified use of armed force, I don't know what is. It's as simple as that. Does it fit within the just war tradition, given it requires competent authority? Yeah, the competent authority in this case are the people with the capacity and the will to deal with the evil. Moral competence does not, Whatever the question of legal competence. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I'm saying. Does Moral it require competence, congressional approval to, to reach that that's, threshold? That's a prudential judgment, as mm -hmm. is whether you go to the UN. Mm -hmm. But the notion that the legal competence of the UN includes an overwhelming or overweening or superseding moral competence, mm -hmm. th there is no way to make that argument, it seems to me, uh, with um, real force given the incapacities of that institution. I wish it were different, but it isn't. Yeah. So therefore, moral competence has to rest elsewhere. Do you think we have a moral responsibility, given that, though the United States is not responsible for ISIS's action, the situation, the dislocation of the Christian sure. community, we, we are responsible in well, part we have a, we have a responsibility, Raymond, as the major power that stands for order, hmm. human rights, decency, fair dealing in world affairs. And we are the only major power that has the will to try to do something about that when things really get bad, yeah. since that will manifestly does not exist in Europe today, unfortunately, with a few exceptions. So, yeah, I think we do have a responsibility, and I think it's incumbent upon the political leadership of the country to explain to the American people why 
we cannot revert to a kind of isolationism mm -hmm. uh, because the world simply won't allow it. It's not without interest that some of these fanatics who have been involved in the brutality in mm -hmm. Syria and northern Iraq have come from the United States and come from Britain. Yeah. Th this is not simply homegrown over there. Yeah. Uh, this is another facet of this that needs to be looked at squarely. Well, and today we just saw the, an Iraqi military post just overrun, 100, 100 people slaughtered uh, yeah. of Iraqi, these are Iraqi troops. So ISIS is on the move, it continues to grow. Yeah. I want to shift from that Please. battle in the Middle East to the battle now along the Tiber. Uh, any day now we're going to begin this synod on the family. In the lead up to this, many months ago, Cardinal Walter Casper waived this proposal about that mercy was needed for those who are divorced and remarried and that that mercy included giving them communion or finding a fast pass, if you will, to give them communion. Your thoughts on what this has, the narrative that this has created, because he's appeared on the cover of European magazines, captured the attention of the whole world's media, and there seems to be a narrative already in place before the Senate ever started. I, I think, as usual, or as is too frequently the case, the narrative and the reality don't cohere. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope that storyline, which addresses, of, which at least deals with a very serious pastoral problem, mm -hmm. does not dominate this. Look, we all know that marriage culture throughout the Western world is in deep, deep crisis. Mm -hmm. We also know, or should know, as Catholics, that we have a very good proposal to make in the face of that. I hope this is a positive synod. This is my Catholic press column next week called Wanted a Positive Synod. <laughs> I, I hope the synod begins by lifting up the beauty and dignity of Christian marriage mm. as the answer to this crisis of marriage culture throughout the world. And I think some of the American bishops intend to do that. I know African bishops for whose people the discovery of Christian marriage has come as an enormous liberation from both ancient customs and the degradation of women yeah. within that are going to be quite vocal on this. And I think it may well be said, at least behind the scenes, if not in public where everyone mm -hmm. tries to be polite, that it is really not up to dying local churches in Europe, some of whom have 7% mass attendance on Sunday, mm -hmm. some of whom have 10% mass attendance on Sunday, to pretend that they have a pastoral answer to the crisis of marriage culture hmm. when they manifestly don't have a pastoral answer to much else right now. Do, do you remember a time, George, when we had this kind of, really since the council, when we had this kind of public expression of disagreement among cardinals in the public sphere, where they're writing books, sure. and you've got Cardinal Burke and Pell and, and uh, Mueller, the head of the CDF, uh, writing a book to contradict what, what Casper is saying, and his repeated uh, lengthy interviews as well as printed comments. Uh, do you remember a time when we had sure. quite this? Sure. This went on all through the 70s and 80s when mm -hmm. the subject was liberation theology. Look, there's nothing wrong with senior churchmen having brisk, intelligent arguments about serious issues. What I hope does not get lost in this, mm -hmm. and let me complement what I just said about Europe with a statement about America. For all of the problems of the church in the United States, we have a better, we have deployed better John Paul II's theology of the body than any church in the Western mm -hmm. world. We have better marriage preparation programs <laughs> than any church in the Western right. world. And we have evolved an approach to the problems of uh, the divorced 
we have a more developed annulment process, if you right. will, than any place else in the world. That experience needs to be brought to bear at the Senate. But there aren't a lot of those people and leaders in those areas, George, who are invited to this Senate. This is a great disappointment, frankly. I think, I think it's a shame that uh, some extraordinarily bright American women, I think of Helen Alvarez, my colleague Mary Eberstadt, mm -hmm. Anna Halpin of the World Youth Alliance, Mary Hassan, another Ethics mm -hmm. and Public Policy Center colleague of mine, the, these are women with great competence in these areas who ought to have been part of the formal conversation. Mm -hmm. And perhaps when this agenda setting Senate, and that's all this is. This first part is. This year, year, next year. When the real conversation gets going in earnest next year, some of them uh, will be there. One of our email correspondents was asking the question, the Pope in authorizing this commission to streamline annulments, isn't he putting the cart before the horse? Well, I, this you is, know, I thought that's what they were discussing, they're saying. Well, this is obviously part of the conversation. And if that gets located in this more positive context than I'm talking about, mm -hmm. of the church lifting up before the world the beauty and dignity of, of marriage understood as a covenant of love and fruitfulness for life, as the answer to this corrosive collapse of marriage culture that is destroying lives and is primarily destroying children's lives, or very heavily weighing on children, mm -hmm. then all of this other tweaking of canonical process or whatever begins to fall into place. It's not so important. Uh, Walter Casper is now, Cardinal Casper, uh, beginning to make noises about contraception needs a relook, he's saying, uh, and perhaps that should be part of the discussion at this synod. Are you concerned that this synod, as it's beginning, it hasn't even begun yet, and yet the public narrative, the Pope, uh, when he married all those couples and the press had to find the two couples, one who was cohabitating, the other who already had children, they used that as evidence that the Pope is interested in sort of remaking the notion of Catholic marriage and permanent marriage. Pope has given absolutely no indication of that whatsoever. He discussed the attempt, uh, he described the attempt to redefine marriage in Argentina when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires as an attack of Satan. He is going to beatify Paul VI at the end of the sentence. So yes, the contraception is coming, question is coming up again, and Paul VI is going to be vindicated mm -hmm. at the close of the Senate. I don't know whether Cardinal Casper hasn't gotten the invitation to the beatification <laughs> ceremony yet. Look, the Catholic Church in John Paul II's Theology of the Body has the most compelling response mm -hmm. to the degradation visited upon our culture mm. by this sexual free fire zone in which we live mm. of any institution in the world. I'm sorry that some people in the church haven't caught on to this. That's a great sadness. But when I go to the 20 or 30 college campuses I visit every year, mm -hmm. what do I find? I find young people organizing discussion groups around this challenging but very compelling material of John Paul II. A quick call. She's on the line. Pam from Maryland. What's your question, Pam? Hi. Um, yes, I would like to know. Um, I heard the president talking at, at the UN and said that um, Islam is a peaceful religion. All right. And um, so, um, what does the Catholic, uh, the Church, believe? What does the church teach in this regard? I think, uh, Raymond and Pam, it's time to get this entire discussion out of sound, sound bites. Mm -hmm. The sound bite, Islam is a religion of peace. The sound bite, we can't have boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop. All of this is cartoon level stuff, mm -hmm. not worthy of a great power. Islam is 1.1 billion people. That's a complex organism part, part of of humanity and to, to deal with these things in these five word uh, cartoon balloons yeah. is just not serious uh, I would suggest that people look at uh, the section on Islam in John Paul II's uh, interview book crossing the threshold oh. of hope yeah. which is very interesting and expresses great respect for the piety 
uh, of Muslims, their, the intensity of their prayer life, their commitment to charity, mm -hmm. and then says, but we've got some issues here. There's a very different idea of God. Yeah. There's a very different idea of the human person. Mm -hmm. There's a very different idea of the sacred text. And this all has got to be talked about in a serious, calm, adult way, not through sound bites. Yeah, yeah, and there is this vein of fundamentalist, deadly Islam that is gaining adherence and the young are listening to it. And I was told by someone, actually an Islamic scholar the other day, many of these people are illiterate who are being uh, drawn to this, but they're taught a few lines from the Quran and they live by that and they repeat a it and they're very fervent. very distinguished Muslim scholar of the just war tradition said to me here in Washington 10 years ago uh, at a conference on that subject, my biggest problem, he taught at a prestigious Northeastern University, hmm. uh, my biggest problem is my students. Hmm. My Muslim students who come from these madrasas that have been set up around the world, usually with Saudi funding, uh, set up around the United States with yep. Saudi funding, who have been taught a very narrow, aggressive mm. form of this complex religious uh, tradition. Mm. That, that was his biggest problem. So that, again, illustrates what I mean about the civil war within, within the Islamic Islam. world that then spills yeah. off yeah. into uh, everything else. George Weichel, thanks so much thanks, for the insight. Randy. Always for, good to for be For doing the you. quick round robin here. George's books, Roman Pilgrimage, The Station Churches and Evangelical Catholicism are available at bookstores everywhere, and they're both worthy reads. You can keep up with George Weichel's columns at National Review Online at nationalreview.com.